G'day again team. So we're still working our way through topic one of our essential book. Now we'll be up to about 1.5 where we're looking at acute responses to exercises. Um, this section will break up into some smaller sections within it. All right, looking at, uh, I guess, the way the circuitry, respiratory and systems work. Okay, so today we're going to look at oxygen consumption. Now, oxygen consumption is generally measured in what we term VO2 max. Now, if you look at VO2 max as just the term, V being volume, O2 is oxygen, maximum. So, maximum volume of oxygen, which, as we've got there, the volume of oxygen consumed by the body for energy production. So, in other words, VO2 max quite simply means how much oxygen can I actually get into my body? The higher the VO2 max, the higher the oxygen. Good thing or bad thing? You'd think good thing. The more oxygen I can get into my body, the higher intensity I will be able to work at and remain in the aerobic system. That's the key. If we can stay in the aerobic system, work submax at a higher intensity, that's going to be better for us. So that's what it all comes back to. That's when we talk about fitness and pre-season and everything like that. The reason we are doing that is so our body is fitter, is the simple answer, but the reason we do that is so that we can work aerobically at a higher intensity. If we work aerobically at a higher intensity, we borrow less oxygen, there's less lactic acid, smaller recovery time. Okay. All right, VOT max, measured in litres per minute. So in other words, how many litres per minute can I get in? Now you see the bird on the treadmill here, if we want to be scientific about it, that is going to be an exact measurement. Quite simply, they put the face mask on you, connect it all up, so everything, your nose, your mouth, everything is uh, connected there. They've got a little spit tube that collects all your saliva, it's delightful. And quite simply, they'll just increase the speed of that treadmill every minute. 12K an hour, 13, 14, 15, keep going till literally she'll fall off the back of the treadmill. Right. For us, we're not quite that uh, technical. One of the best forms of measuring a VO2, or easiest forms, is our old beep test. So they've done, put enough people through that beep test that they can work out based on your height, your weight, your age, your gender, based on the level you got, this is your predicted VO2 max. Okay. Um, basically, we can keep going until we reach our point of maximum oxygen consumption. At that point, hey, we can't get much more, and that's where we're going to be shut down. So as we've spoken about previously, definition for those that want to keep writing them down, maximum volume of oxygen consumed by the body for energy production. Right. Vertu max. Now, maximum oxygen consumption is measured in relative terms. So what that means is we take into consideration kilograms. If you look at, let's take myself, six foot three or 188 centimetres, if you compare me to someone who's 150 centimetres. I am going to have a greater VO2 max because I'm bigger. My lungs are bigger, I'm going to be able to absorb more oxygen in. But if you then compare that with weight, I'm 188 kilos and I'm 88, 188 kilos, 188 centimetres and 88 kilograms, whereas that person who's 150 centimetres might only be 50 kilos. So if we can actually put it in relative terms, so meals per kilo per minute, we're taking into consideration not only the maximum volume of oxygen, but also the weight. All right? So that way we can actually compare. So what I've got here is um, an example of some VO2 maxes, just approximate value. So you can see if we look at running, so runners, and these are athletes from the AIS, as you can see. Runners, 65 to 80, 55 to 70. All right, Men are generally going to have high values. Sorry, girls, I'm not being sexist. Bigger in size, okay. Greater lung capacity. Uh, rowers, again, the 50s to 70s. Cycling, 60s to 80s. All right. Now, there is some recorded evidence of people having VO2 maxes as high as 90. Uh, Brett Aitken, who was a... Olympic gold medalist in Sydney when he first went to whichever institute of sport he was at, probably the AIS. 
he wasn't that into cycling and they put him on a VO2 test and his VO2 was up around the 90s, which is just amazing, okay? Us, in terms of regular sort of country athletes, you know, some of us are probably going to be up around the, the 55, 65s, even nudging the 70s, right? But generally, I'd probably be tipping around the 60, 65s. Okay, so that's our VO2 max. Next thing we're looking at is OBLA, right? Onset blood lactate accumulation, OBLA. Or if it's going to help you, lactic threshold is very similar. Right? So in other words, the onset of blood lactic acid, blood lactate accumulation, OBLA, that's the point where lactic acid builds up in the body greater than can be removed. Now even sitting down listening to this tune at the moment, you've got lactic acid naturally occurring in your body. Small amounts, as you can see down here, generally one millimole, something like that. As we exercise, it starts to increase. But as it's light exercise, our body goes, well, hang on, I've produced more lactic acid. No, we can remove it, it's okay. As the exercise increases, our body continually gets asked that question. Hey, we've produced it, can you remove it? Yes. Produced it, can you remove it? Yes. Right. Then it's going to get to a point where our body is going to go, well, you've produced more than I can remove. And that's going to be our obla or our lactic threshold. In other words, the point where lactic acid builds up in the body more than we can actually remove it. Okay. So this determines the maximum exercise intensity you can maintain for an extended period of time. So if you like, our obla or our lactic threshold is the point where your body goes from working aerobically to anaerobically. So if we think about it, we're running around the oval. If we're just jogging at 50%, no drums, we're in the aerobic system. Our body goes, hey, I've produced some lactic acid, no worries, I can remove it. If we would have pushed that up to, let's say, 90% of our max heart rate, our body is going to go, whoa, 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 this is really intense. I'm having to work anaerobically here. I've got this lactic acid that I've produced. I can't remove it all. And that's where our body would shut down. So we would either have to slow our pace or we're basically going to burn out. But what we can do, the more trained an athlete is, the greater the tolerance they have. So in other words, what we can do is we can raise our lactic threshold. We can raise the point where blood lactate accumulates. Generally, in most people, it'll be around the 85% of their heart rate max, generally. But with training, we can raise that. And that's where our marathon runners, they actually do this. They'll raise their lactic threshold or their obla up to the 90s, 92s, 93s. So they can work aerobically at 93% of their heart rate, which, what's the advantage? You can work at a higher intensity for longer whilst still being in the aerobic system, okay? As you say here, see some athletes have readings even as high as 20 millimoles of blood lactate and can still work. So in other words, they're working at a very high intensity, but their body, since they're so fit, is going, you know what, you've produced 20 millimoles, I can remove that, no dramas. Well, that was a fancy fade out. Oh, it's going to be annoying. Okay, oxygen deficit. So deficit, if you have a deficit, what you're lacking, all right? Quite simply, all right? Deficit means we're lacking in something. So in other words, lacking in oxygen if it's oxygen deficit. So the body is always delayed to the response of exercise. So in other words, you're sitting there doing nothing. If you decide to jump up, run out into the backyard, your heart rate is delayed. So that's why when you actually stop exercising, your heart rate and breathing rate are still going. So I could run a 400 metre race, stop, and you've crossed the finish line, you've still got the heavy breathing, the panting, the heart rate still racing. It's because our body is delayed in the response to exercise. So that first period when we start exercising is what we actually term oxygen deficit. In other words, we're lacking in oxygen for that first period. And how that actually happens, think back to our energy systems, that ATP-CP system, since that relies upon stored energy, it doesn't actually need oxygen. So this is how it all comes together. 
That first energy system is designed to work with, in effect, nothing but stored, stored supplies. So in other words, we can get through that first system, we can be lacking in oxygen. Our body is actually designed to do that. So that first little period is what we term oxygen deficit, which means, hey, we're relying on anaerobic systems, which is what we just spoke about. That first system, ATP, CP, right, that's on stored energy. We're able to use that because we're relying on that stored energy. So if we have a look here, this is the period. So this is oxygen consumption. Oxygen consumption, saying light to moderate exercise. There's rest, there's exercise recovery. So in other words, we've gone from standing there doing nothing to starting exercise, so we need more oxygen. Now what's happened is, this line's levelled out, which would suggest what? If you've said steady state or submax exercise, well firstly there was a hint here, light to moderate, so yep, yeah, submax exercise. In other words, the oxygen needed is equal with oxygen supply, so we've reached steady state. Therefore, this little section here is the only oxygen deficit. We then stop, our body's able to recover. Whereas this one here, okay, we can see the oxygen consumption keeps going up, keeps going up, keeps going up, keeps going up. And this line never really plateaus out. And they've actually shown us this is the oxygen requirement. So what this suggests, as the title here says, this is quite intense activity. In other words, our body's saying, hey, dude, I need this much oxygen. And your body's going, I can only get you this much. So what that means is, we're working anaerobically for this entire period. So that means all of this is an oxygen deficit. So for an example, this might be a 400 metre race, for example. Very intense. You never reach a steady state, you never submax. you're relying a lot of your time on anaerobic pathways. And we experience oxygen deficit for almost the entire race. Now you can see also the difference in recovery sizes. Since this was submax, all right, in other words, we've had a very small oxygen deficit, we've had a very small recovery. Whereas here, a huge oxygen deficit, which means a bigger recovery. And if you look at the size of these shapes, this shape here is very similar to this shape here. Same as this little wedge here is very similar to this little wedge. And this is what we want to do. We want to become fitter so that we work aerobically more. Let's say this was a fit person, if, all right, they've reached submax, therefore they've got a very small oxygen deficit, therefore very small recovery. This is the benefit of increasing our aerobic fitness. Okay, so EPOC. Now this is these little sections here we're talking about now, the recovery part. EPOC. Excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption. Excessive, too much. Post, after exercise, oxygen is at consumption. So we've got too much after exercise oxygen consumption. In other words, once we've finished exercising, we still have oxygen consumption. As we've said a couple of slides back, the body is delayed to the response of exercise. So we finish the 400 meters, our breathing rate is still quite high. That's because We've got excessive post-oxygen consumption. We're trying to get oxygen into the body to pay back this little deficit that we borrowed. So that's EPOC right there. Our breathing rate is still up. And as the recovery goes on, eventually it comes back to normal. Body needs to pay back oxygen deficit and start replenishing our ATP. Okay. Restoration of myoglobin and hemoglobin. Okay. Now... Hemoglobin is what carries oxygen around the blood. Myoglobin is what takes the oxygen out of the blood into the working muscles. Definition, hey, there we are, hemoglobin. Heme, heme generally refers to blood, okay? So the oxygen-carrying component of blood. So in other words, in the blood we have hemoglobin. That grabs onto the oxygen and rides it through the bloodstream, going, come with us, till we get down to the working muscles. Okay. Epoch. How big is our epoch? Well, the duration of epoch depends on the duration intensity of exercise. So the harder the exercise, the more intense it is, the greater the epoch will be. Okay? The lighter the exercise, in other words, submax, 
the smaller the epoch will be. Why? Because we've borrowed less. You know? We have borrowed less oxygen, therefore we have less to pay back. Now, epoch is actually made up of two components, alact acid and lact acid. That's what we're going to look at now. Alact acid is the fast component. So its main focus is restoring that first energy system, ATP, CP. We want to resynthesize that. Now that is done in three minutes. So we, whatever it might be, we play a sport, we go for a run, whatever it might be. For the sake of the story, I'm doing the 1500 metres. I've crossed the finish line. The moment I stop, stop running, the first three minutes is focused on uh, replenishing the ATP stores. Three minutes, that's done. Next component is the lact acid. The lact acid component is the slow component, and it's focused on removing lactic acid. Now, that can take up to 90 minutes, all right, depending on, again, the intensity and duration of the activity. So our epoch is based on two things. A lact acid, in other words, the quick one. Let's replenish our ATP stores. And then this lactic acid is all about removing the lactic acid component. Okay? So we've been through that one. So, a few questions here. If you could define these terms, VO2 max, obla, oxygen deficit, epoch, steady state, sub max. If you could write a sentence or a definition about them, you're on the right track. A couple of questions here. Look at the data below. There's three athletes, X, Y, and Z. It's got their mass, it's got their VO2 max in litres, and then their anaerobic threshold. So in other words, the point they start working anaerobically. Assuming all other factors are equal, which athlete would most likely be the better endurance performer? There might be a little bit of maths needed here. But remember, VO2 needs to be relative, so we need to take into consideration mass. So for example, we go, athlete X is the heaviest. But athlete X also has the biggest VO2 max. If we look at just Y and Z, we go, who's going to be the better? Same maths, Z, okay? Z has got a greater oxygen consumption because you then think, oh, maybe Z's better. This is the line of thinking we need to have. And last question with reference to energy systems, consider why it's beneficial for a 5,000 metre runner to A, perform a warm up prior to the start of the race. B, remain at or below their lactic threshold for the majority of the race. And C, participate in low-level physical activity after the race. So there's a few questions there. Some are a little bit easier than others. But it might be a matter of you having a go at them, and we can discuss them later on. So good luck with those, and until next time, catch up.